we're going to continue and we're going to begin to change uh, from the acute setting to more subacute and chronic neck pain. And I'm pleased to say that the interventions that we use in the chronic and perhaps the subacute phase seem to be a bit more data-based and a bit more effective than what we heard earlier this morning and uh, about the acute state. So we're, I'm pleased to have Carol Hartigan, who has done a lot of the important research on exercise and back pain particularly, but also neck pain, to talk to us about is exercise effective for chronic neck pain? And then we'll be talking about if it is effective, why does it work? So Carol will uh, talk to us about this next subject. Thank you very much, and thanks to Jerome and to the North American Spine Society. And I remember, um, I think the first time I met Jerome, he may not remember, was when I was giving an abstract about 18 years ago at North American Spine Society, and he was the first one to make a comment and ask a question. <laughs> I'll, I'll remind him later what it was. And I knew he was from New York right away, <laughs> which I am too, by the way. So let's ask this question, is exercise effective for chronic neck pain, and try to answer it today. People with chronic neck pain, there are numerous studies that have documented 30 to 50 percent reduction in isometric neck strain for flexion, extension, rotation, and lateral flexion compared to normal controls. Equally uh, strong studies show reduced 30 to 50 percent range of motion in this population compared to controls. And other studies reveal that uh, the neck pain disability index and the Oswestry disability index are greater for people with chronic neck pain than normals, as is the fear avoidance behavior questionnaire scale. One study of 179 women with chronic neck pain showed that with a maximum voluntary contraction, the greater the pain that the women reported, the less strength they could produce. And two different studies show that with exertion uh, and electromyographic testing that there's greater muscle fatigue in people with chronic neck pain compared to normals. So does the neck pain cause the weakness and the reduction in flexibility and the fear and the reduced function or vice versa, or is it a spiraling effect and each aggravates the other? It doesn't really matter. Because of this finding, it certainly makes sense to think about treating this problem of chronic neck pain with exercise, at least based on those findings. So let's look at other treatments for chronic neck pain. We've, we touched on a lot of these this morning. And if you do go and look at the literature regarding other treatments, there, there isn't necessarily evidence refuting a lot of these treatments, but there isn't any evidence to support long-term efficacy or medium-term efficacy for mobilization, manipulation, manual therapy, traction, ultrasound, hot packs, or electrical stimulation for chronic axial neck pain. There are only a couple of decent studies looking at injections for chronic axial neck pain. Arm pain and radiculopathy is a different story. And uh, the evidence is fairly limited and the studies are not good. And I'm just going to put surgery to the side. Axial neck pain is totally different than disc herniation and radiculopathy. There's not much evidence that supports efficacy of cervical spine surgery for axial benign neck pain. There is moderate evidence for exercise to treat chronic neck pain, and let's go over the literature regarding this. I looked at all of the very good randomized controlled studies that evaluate exercise interventions for chronic neck pain, and I want all of us to think about our patients with chronic neck pain. You know, they come in and they have this pain, and what they've had done to them is just stuff, and nobody's ever really told them it's safe and get moving. And I want us to think about what the different exercises in these studies are as, as I go through them. Some of the studies use specific neck exercises where the neck is moving against resistance or not. Uh, sometimes it's just upper body and shoulder exercises, and sometimes it's general exercises versus other. And then I'm going to three of the studies that I'll present talk about uh, cognitive behavioral interventions and multidimensional treatment. So I'm going to present these studies in chronological order. In 2001 and 2002, Bronford and Evans, the same Bronford I think that you um, mentioned in your articles, uh, randomized 191 
individuals with chronic axial neck pain into three groups who had 20 sessions over 11 weeks. The first group uh, did resisted neck strengthening with a pulley, and they did up to 10 pounds of resistance uh, for 10 repetitions for five seconds against a pulley of up to 10 pounds. So they were doing five seconds of 10 reps in flexion, five reps, 10 reps in extension, and then they did a rotation, 10 reps to the right against 10 pounds and 10 reps. That's a, like a lot of work. I, my neck already feels better. Uh, they also did some shoulder stretches, dumbbells, and push-ups. The second group had Medex treatment, which is iso-inertial, the same thing, against weight, back and forth, and rotation, 10 reps in each direction for each of the 20 sessions. And the final group had, had massage and manipulation and a sham microcurrent treatment. And the outcomes for this study showed that at both the one and the two-year follow-up, the exercise groups demonstrated a significant reduction in pain from uh, an average of 5.8 on the visual and analog scale down to a 3.0, which is very good, almost 50 percent. And they also showed significant improvements in strength and range of motion while there wasn't any change at all in the passive treatment group. The next study came out of Finland in 2003, and in this study, 393 patients with chronic nonspecific neck pain were randomized into one of three groups. Uh, 12 weeks of training for 30 minutes, three times a week, with one reinforcement session at six months. And the first group did dynamic upper body muscle training with dumbbells of the large muscle groups of the shoulder and back. No specific neck muscle exercises were uh, employed in this study. The second group went and met for 30 minutes three times a week for 12 weeks and focused during that 30 minutes on relaxing, relaxing their muscles and generally just relaxing. And the third group uh, was told to continue with their ordinary activity. All three groups were told that there wasn't any difference in the efficacy for these treatments. And again, there were no direct neck exercises applied. And this study found that there wasn't any difference between any of these three groups. The pain, disability, range of motion, and strength was reduced in all three groups on the order of 4.5 visual analog, analog scale to 2.7, and that the upper body training wasn't superior to relaxation training or ordinary activity training. And this is the only one of the studies that doesn't really show that exercise makes a difference. Then another study came out out of Finland, and this study has about eight spin-offs off the same cohort. Um, and what they did is they took 180 women with chronic neck pain, and they randomized them into one of three groups. They had 12 45-minute sessions, and then they were told to maintain with the exercises that they were given in those sessions for three times a week. The first group was the so-called strengthening group, and this group performed one set of 15 specific strengthening exercises against a band at 80 percent their maximum uh, contraction. And that was a 15 repetitions for a five-second hold for flexion and extension. So forward for a hard, holding hard for five seconds, holding hard again, going back, and then the obliques. As the other study was rotation, this one just did the obliques. And uh, again, that's pretty a lot of movement for a person who may have been be impaired or restricted or fearful or guarded with neck pain. And the second group was the so-called endurance group that did uh, simply from a supine position three sets of 20 head lifts. I'm only up to four. I, I already feel better again. And then they went prone, and they did three sets of 20. And, and so they're basically moving the neck that's been bothering them to, to give them their chronic pain. And both of these groups did um, some upper body exercises uh, that consisted of um, shrugs, bench press, biceps curl, bent over laterals, flies, and pullovers. I, I'd like to tell you what these exercises are because they're not complicated, and I want us to know that. And the, the strength group performed those six exercises at the maximum for 15 repetitions, and the endurance group performed it with up to two kilogram dumbbells. So very simple exercises. Both groups did some stretching and aerobics. And in this study, both of these groups had cognitive behavioral treatment where they were given permission, told that it's safe, challenge to overcome their barriers to exercise, et cetera. And the third group had just stretching and aerobics. So they were active, but it wasn't uh, neck or upper body focused. And what these researchers found was that both the strength and the endurance groups had significant improvements in pain disability and improvements in strength and range of motion. The pain in the strengthening group went from 5.7 visual analog scale to 2.2. 
in the endurance group from 5.8 to 1.8. Disability scores went from 22 to 14 in the strength group and 21 to 12 in the endurance group. And the control group did not have an improvement. These researchers published another article where they looked at this group and found that the groups that underwent the strength and endurance training had significant reductions in headache, arm pain, and they had improved health-related quality of life at one-year follow-up compared to controls. They also originally did some pressure point, pain pressure threshold testing at five areas in the neck and one point in the sternum, and at the one-year follow-up they found that there was significant improvement in the pain pressure threshold in both the strength and the endurance groups, and in this case the strength group had a better improvement in the different sites for their pain pressure threshold. Then what they did is they took the 59 women who had been in the stretching and aerobic group at one year and put them through the high intensity uh, training with the, with the pulley band at 80% of their maximum uh, possible contraction for the, f for the 15 repetitions for a five second hold for flexion, extension, and obliques to both sides and the six upper body exercises at, at their 15 rep max. And this group then had a significant decrease in their pain and disability at one year after they started that treatment. So that's the third study. The two out of three so far support exercise. The fourth study out of Hong Kong in 2004 by Chu looked at 145 patients with chronic axial neck pain of greater than three months duration with 67% of these patients having greater than 12 months of pain and randomized the patients into twice a week for six weeks treatment of either a medex like dynamic flexion and extension exercise against resistance or control infrared radiation group. And at the six weeks, just at the completion of treatment and six months after follow-up, the exercise group had a significant improvement in pain, disability, strength, and satisfaction and care. So at six weeks, the exercise group had a 39% reduction in pain. At six months, it stayed solid at 34%. And at six weeks, their improvement in disability was 29%, which remained stable at 27% at six months. Out of Denmark, Anderson in 2008 published a study looking at 549 uh, people uh, at seven different workplaces who were randomized to three different groups who had three times per week 20-minute sessions for one year. The first group had specific resistance, and they did a five-second isometric hold against a weighted pulley at near their max voluntary contraction for 15 repetitions. And this one was a little different. It was, you know, these five-second holds for 15 reps for flexion, extension, and in this case they did lateral flexion uh, to get those muscles going. And they also did um, 15 repetition max weight for front raise, lateral raise, the uh, thumbs down supraspinatus exercise, and shoulder shrug. Um, and they were also told to do some cardio exercises like rowing or kayaking. And the second group uh, in the workplaces, they, ins they, they cleaned out closets and put in bikes and treadmills and they put barbells in the doorway and they encouraged them to be active and to walk to work and to take a walk after work and to go for a bike ride and kick the soccer ball and do those things during their 20-minute sessions. And then there was a general health group that met together in a, in a seated kind of setting and talked about health. Um, but a large, a large population at the end of the one-year intervention there was a significant reduction in pain in both of the groups that had the active treatment. The spe next specific isometric exercises and just the general get moving group uh, improved by a, a pain visual analog scale of 5.0 to a 3.4. Uh, the last study, uh, Zebus, looked at 537 high risk workers and among them were people with neck and shoulder pain. And these workers were randomized into two groups who had uh, 20 weeks of three times a week treatment, and they were given no specific neck exercises, but five dumbbell exercises, which were uh, front raise, lateral raise, bent over lateral, shoulder shrug, and wrist extension with dumbbells. And they did a typical um, progressive resisted program with a linear acceleration of the resisted load, and then periods of so-called undulating acceleration where they gave them a super high load for uh, a session or two and then back down a little bit to their 15 repetition max again. Um, and the second group had just advice to remain active. 
and these researchers found that the specific exercise group only had a significant reduction in neck and shoulder pain that was quite significant from a visual analog scale of 4.7 to 1.8. So of these studies, I, th I think I might have added these up wrong, but uh, they show the superior, the superior exercise is, is neck exercise, but there's also evidence to support just upper body and aerobic and stretching exercise, while one study found that general exercise wasn't really any better than um, health advice uh, or nonspecific exercise. So there's, there's a strong trend favoring exercise, uh, specific neck, upper body, and general exercise for neck pain in very good studies, very nice randomized studies. So now there's a, a couple more studies I just want to mention. Um, cognitive behavioral orientation is a term that we've tossed around a little bit this morning. People who have chronic neck pain have been told not to do things. They've been told their C3 is rotated compared to their C4 and they're, they're out of whack and they need to be, they need to avoid things, they can't do things, they, they don't lift the laundry, they don't lift the baby. They, and, um, Cognitive behavioral orientation starts with the physician giving the message that it's safe, there isn't anything dangerous. Most of these people have had MRIs, so the explanation regarding the fact that the bulges are okay or that the herniation is clinically silent or clinically irrelevant is a part of the cognitive behavioral intervention. And then challenging, what do you want? What did you like? What, what do you hope for? Uh, what do you, where are you going to join the gym? I can't join a gym. Why can't you join a gym? Here's how you can join a gym. This is what you can do. Um, and um, you haven't been taking out the laundry, why don't you take out a half a load to this week? Why don't you empty the bottom rack of the dishwasher? Why don't you put the dish, pick up the dishes and put them in? A lot of that challenge, wow, you did the dishes. Oh, you went out and threw the ball. Oh, you got on the bike. These sorts of things are, are cognitive behaviorally oriented treatment. Well behaviors are reinforced. Uh, sick behaviors are uh, ignored, let's say. Uh, there's a lot of coaching and there's often a team involved where an individual who's receiving treatment is getting the same feedback from everyone. And there are two studies, well, in including the Yelinen study out of Finland that used cognitive behavioral approach and showed that it was effective with exercise. This really nice study of 214 patients from Sweden who were sick listed, which is really, really a red flag in Sweden, <laughs> um, for one to six months were randomized to one of four groups. Uh, four weeks of treatment to either physical therapy or cognitive behavioral therapy or physical therapy plus cognitive behavioral therapy or just a control group. I won't get into the details. Um, and this study found that physical therapy plus cognitive behavioral therapy was far superior to all the other three interventions. And, and the funny thing, the new Scandinavian studies come out, they don't even look at, mention, or care about disability or pain. They care about money and sick days. And so they only looked at sick leave, retirement, health-related quality of life. They found that this group who had PT plus cognitive behavioral therapy had 201 less sick leave days than the control group. And they just published a 10-year follow-up this August, and they showed that the PT plus cognitive behavioral group had 42 fewer sick days per year compared to the other three groups. So that's big. And uh, another study out of Sweden, the same authors, a different study, looked at neck and back pain. In 255 patients, 27 percent of whom had chronic axial neck pain, they did a seven-year follow-up of sort of conventional orthomanual therapy where there were some um, uh, modalities uh, applied and low-intensity exercise versus a eight hours a day, five days a week, four weeks multidisciplinary program with intensive exercise and cognitive behavioral intervention. And again, they don't care about pain or disability, they care about money. And they found that at the seven-year follow-up, there was a lot less sickness and disability pension in the group that had multidisciplinary treatment, and that they actually saved, they calculated 94,000 euros per patient in that seven-year period. So um, it's one way to look at things that, in that socialized setting. <laughs> We looked at our database. We, we didn't, we published on back pain. We didn't, never did uh, like a long-term outcome on our neck pain, but Lisa Childs and I, uh, she's our head physical therapist, just went through our um, database. And we don't enter every patient. We try to enter every patient, so it's not like a com consecutive patients. But we looked back over a 23-month period and had 144 chronic neck pain patients entered in our database. And we do a very similar treatment of cognitive behavioral orientation. We do a similar neck-resisted uh, program, a simple uh, upper body program, and some general conditioning. A lot of cognitive behavioral therapy. And we, the patients average nine visits 
these 144 patients, and at, the, at their discharge at about five to six weeks, their pain had gone down from 5.1 to 2.9 on the visual analog scale. Their Oswestry disability scale went from 26 to 16. Their ability to lift from uh, waist to shoulder went up from 11 to 21 pounds. Their flexion improved by 10 degrees, extension by 14 degrees, lateral flexion by 10 degrees, and rotation by 11 degrees at the time that they were discharged. So uh, to conclude, chronic neck pain is often benign. I didn't even talk about all the studies that these people have had showing that they have this and that, but nothing dangerous or unsafe is associated with pain, reduced range of motion, deconditioning, disability, fear avoidance, and that simple progressive exercises focusing on the neck, upper body, and general exercises are extremely effective and that a cognitive behavioral approach and a positive message and challenge uh, are also effective. And that's it. Thank you.